Good morning, afternoon, evening, or wherever it is in your part of the universe. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about fixing the rudder on my 7 metre sailing boat, or 22 feet in American talk, because um, it's had a problem. If we just look down here, you can see that my bottom rudder gudgeon has had some exfoliation. You can see the fracture points there, and the whole top of it's gone. This has actually been aggravated by um, uh, some low tides in the pen where the rudder would touch the bottom a bit, um, although it's only sand, um, when powerboat wakes came past at low tide. So this clearly needs to be fixed. Here's the top gudgeon. When the bottom pin failed, the uh, top gudgeon has bent a bit. I've tried to straighten that out, but I think I still have some more to go. This is 6mm 316 plate, I imagine. Uh, so it's fucking Mordich, I can tell you. Um, or Skookum if you're in North, North America and you're an AVE watcher on YouTube. Um, this is a little problematic because one of the things that can happen, well, does happen with metals, is when you bend them backwards and forwards, they harden and become brittle. And I do not want this weld to become brittle so as much as I've given it a fair old welly trying to straighten it out, because it was bent a little more that way, sorry, that way, um, initially, um, I'm a bit nervous, although visual inspection of the weld there, well, it looks pretty good. You'd expect to see some cracking or fracture, I think. And it's an old, this is an old gudgeon. I, you know, this was probably made in the mid 1980s and it's now 2018. Anyway, that brings us back to this. My plan here is to drill this pin out and put a bolt in there actually, um, because that will actually also act as a retaining clip uh, with a, obviously with a, a nylock nut on it. I suspect this may have happened. This is the bottom gudgeon. And I suspect this may have happened because uh, occasionally anti-fouling would get put on this pin because it's, it's, it's way down the bottom of the boat near the water line. It's not in the water, but it's close. Um, and we all know anti-fouling has all sorts of heavy metals and stuff in it to keep the greeblies off your boat. Um, and I wonder if that may have affected this because like seriously, that really looks like the mice have been at it. So here we are at the rudder. I've always wondered what's inside this rudder because um, over the years when I pull the boat out to redo the anti-foul, I've noticed a dribble at the foot of the rudder down there. Um, so I knew it had a leak. Um, because the gudgeons have broken, and you can see there's a little bit of a repair I have to do there as well where the bottom gudgeon goes. Um, I was curious as to why it was leaking. So I've drilled some holes in it to see where the hollow is. And obviously the front, there's some plywood. And although, I filled up that hole to see where the water went. That wood actually is actually still fairly sound. I mean, you can tell when plywood's wet, it goes black and horrible, and you can pick it out with your fingernail, or probably the end of your man bits. It's very soft and, and mushy, and that wood, that's not too bad. But further back, back here, you can see there's a hole, so that the bottom half, here we are, sorry, I'll point the camera properly. The bottom half of this rudder, or the back half, I should say, the trailing half, um, is actually hollow and you can see there's the water goes down the hole there and in fact if we pop that in and build a little head up he said waiting you can see over there there's a hole in the bottom of the rudder so this all needs to be fixed um, I'll probably post a few videos about how I go about this. Um, it's probably a good time to actually like get all the anti foul and primer off, take it back to proper plastic. Um, and I'll be using epoxy. I'm not going to bother with uh, polyester resin. I don't even have polyester in my workshop anymore now. I just everything I do, I do with epoxy. It's a uh, far superior product. And um, generally speaking, um, Nowhere near as expensive as it was when I was a lad. So here we are. Time to try and deal with this problem here. So what I plan to do, I grind this off flush with this surface here, punch a hole in it, 
centre drill that, and then drill this hole out to 12 millimetres. At which point, we have a 316 stainless bolt here. I'm going to cut that off, probably about there somewhere, round the end off a bit, put it through the hole, weld the flats on so we have a new pin. I wonder how that's going to go. Just a note on angle grinders, a note on angle grinders. You notice this disc is, is worn down quite a bit. It would normally fill this guard here. Um, and probably using them when they're this worn down is bad. I was just lazy. Um, you'll notice when they get worn down because the smell they make when you're grinding changes. Um, and although in years and years, and I'm like talking over 20 years of using angle grinders to do all sorts of things because you can put so many fittings on here. Um, this is a cutting disc. You can put a metal grinding disc on. You can put a concrete grinding disc on, believe it or not, and a you know masonry concrete cutting disc. You can put diamond discs on them and cut ceramic wall tiles. Um, you can put like a coarse diamond disc on it and cut paving bricks and such like. And you could put like a sanding pad with coarse sandpaper and like really grind out fiberglass before you do repairs. We'll see a bit of that later. Um, and in fact, grind away crappy wood that you might want to like graft some replacement in because stuff has um, uh, gone bad, quite bad. Anyway, the angle grinder. It's a useful tool in the shop. So this is a marine grade stainless or 316 it's called. Um, and it's enormously mortage, I can tell you. It's tough as nails. So I make myself a bit of cutting fluid, which is like tight ass cheap. It's like a bit of Kero, bit of oil. Oops. And it's nearly in the middle. The drill wandered a bit off the center punch mark. But um, if I had two hands, I'd have brushed the chips away as we worked and popped a little bit more oil on it. But um, one hand is holding the wonderful little GoPro-y thing. So, much bigger drill. So lots of downforce. So we're supporting the, the job. There's actually a bit that sticks out the bottom there. We're supporting the job with a um, bit of scrap here so that it doesn't all tip up like that. And because the drill is big, I'm going to use these belts here to, um, oh man, doing this one handed is going to be hard, to slow this sucker down. And in fact, I'm going to need both hands. So here we are, back at the drill press. And um, we have our hole. Very nice. So we just talk about drilling for a bit. This is a quite a large drill, it's 12 millimeters or half inch if you're archaic, a bit under half inch. Um, and we went very, very slowly because this, this is thick, probably about five mil, maybe six, um, 316 stainless, it's hard. So drilling it is problematic. We did a little pilot hole with a small drill, we can rev it up a bit. Um, not sure how fast I had the drill press going, but like on one of its higher gears, but this is now currently running on the slowest speed it will possibly do. So, as you can see, we got some quite nice chips off it. My drill sharpening is a bit manky. You'll have only one flute on the drill was producing nice chips. The other one was producing you know, something every once in a while. But then, you know, sharpening a drill by eye, uh, you know, once it's new, I never get it pro properly right again. But it's good enough to do the job. Um, also, you'll notice... This is well clamped in here. If this had caught, spinny, spinny, smack, smack on the wrist, 
Not a good thing. Not a good thing. Okay, so here's the underside of this. And you can see we've got quite a burr there where the bottom of the old pin, let's call it, was sticking out. Because they wanted something to weld on. So they let the pin protrude, you know, maybe six or eight millimetres. And that allowed them to weld around it. They could have probably left the pin flush and just done a big blob on top. But then how are you going to see if the weld's breaking down? At least with this, you can actually see the, the flat plate, the pin and the weld. So you got a fighting chance if, you, if the weld is cracking, you'll, you'll see it. Anyway, we need to remove this. Here's the person for the job. And I don't have three hands, so I'm going to do this in private. So we're back at the vise now, and here's the plan. Our 12 mil bolt fits beautifully in our 12 mil hole. And I'm going to weld around probably three of these flats here. Uh, basically, I'll tack it gently first to get it vertical because one of the things that happens when you weld is the bit you've just welded gets very hot and then gets very cold and when it does that it shrinks and so if it happens to be on this side it shrinks and so our bolt moves that way so basically when you're welding you've got to think about that it's not so important like the pin I'll probably cut it off afterwards in fact I'm putting the whole thing on here because it's easier to see if it's vertical while it's long long um, and then once I've uh, got this on here, snippity snip, probably the good pair of kitchen scissors or something, round the end off, and um, and we have a gudgeon ready to go back on the rudder. Um, the question is, I'm a stick welder, um, and two days ago, I bought all the kit that allows my little uh, welder down here to do TIG work, gas bottle there and what have you had this welder for ages actually it's a fucking cheap shitty thing but shit it's been really good i it was like bunnings were clearing them out for like 90 dollars because the zito were going from orange to gray yeah that's the word a zito but anyway and you can see this this needs um sharpening your tig electrode is something that needs to be super sharp anyway i've had a play with it and i could sort of weld so i'm backing myself to be able to do this if I can't, well, you can laugh along with me. Yeah. So here we are. First, Noisy Andrew's first attempt at uh, actual TIG welding rather than on a bit of scrap. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. There's a bit of a bag key bit around here where I didn't get it to flow properly. But um, that bolt I think is pretty soundly secured in there. Um, I didn't weld around the back here because like how the fuck do you get the cup in there? Anyway, I'm, I'm assuming that like this was welded with a wire MIG or something like that with a small handpiece on it. But they're like, I don't know. I'm not mortgage enough to get that in there yet. But really, given what this does, I think that should be pretty damn good. We'll just keep an eye on it when we're sailing. It's a case of like, you know, maintain your boat. Keep an eye on all the things that, you, you know, where you know there's load and crap and uh, sort it out. So now we're going to cut this off put a little round on it so it's easy to guide the, the rudder on over the gudgeon holders or the other half of the gudgeon. I'm just going to make this one a little bit longer because it's actually going to make it easier to put it on the boat then because like you can line one up before you line the second one up and drop it in. Um, if you look at the top one, the top one's a bit shorter and it's got a retaining hole in it. Um, yeah, previous guy's welding's better than mine but um, I feel okay. <laughs> I thought I'd have a word about using rotating machinery, whether it's a grinder or an angle grinder, like my little Dewalt that I introduced earlier, or this bench grinder, or a linishing belt, or even over here, I don't know if you can see it, but I have a wire wheel as well, which is like good for cleaning shit up. 
The fact is, they spin down at the front. So if I'm grinding something up here and it catches, which it's unlikely to do on this, but it's very likely to do on a wire wheel, it's going to get thrown back into my stomach, or worse. Whereas if I am I'm grinding down here, then the wheel's actually like pulling away almost from the job. So it just it's going to flick this way, if that even. So it's really worthwhile when you're using rotating machinery to think about which way it rotates and um, what's going to happen if it like gets a hold of the job in your hand. Another thing is, this is the plane of the disc here. I never stand with my eyes or my face in line with that plane. I always stand off to one side or the other so that, you know, if something flies off this, it's going to go out in that plane. It's not going to probably go that way. So if my body, my vital bits being like, you know, eyes and penis are in the way, that's bad news. But if they're out here, it's probably going to miss me. Anyway, we're going to... um. Just, I've ground this off with the pair of kitchen scissors like I showed you, well, mentioned I would. Um, and we're just gonna round this off so it's a bit neat now. We've had a bit of a hiccup in proceedings here. Um, after my successful welding, I realised there was a little crack running down here on this gudgeon. And I was like, I should investigate that. So um, we stuck it in the vise and gave it a heave and sure enough it broke here. So I'm going to clean this, well, clean this up and give it some fresh welding. Just when I thought I only had a little bit of weld to do, now I've got some more. Oh well, glad it happened in the workshop and not on the water. So here we are, I've set up to weld this back where it should be. And the trick with this will be um, getting the right width here. So I've cut a block out that's the same width as the, um, the rudder stock. And I've put a bolt through it just to hold it and it's in the vise. I'm going to tack it at both ends, have a look and see how that goes, and then probably fill it down the inside and then down the outside. Obviously, when I weld this, it's going to make, want to make the angle open this way when I weld down the back, and when I weld on the inside, it'll make it want to close. Roughly, hopefully, they're both about the same. Uh, we'll go slowly with a few test fits um, and see how we go. So here we are, the time has come to fill the holes that I put in the rudder when I wanted to find out where it was hollow and how hollow it was and how the water was getting inside it. I'm using uh, West System Epoxy, um, I didn't used to, but I don't know, I've changed. Today's um, a bit warm, so I'm using Slow Hardener, basically with this resin you could, there's a range of different hardeners for different things, including a clear one that supposedly doesn't yellow when it's in the sun. So you measure this by weight, five to one. So in here we have 50 mil of the 105 resin and 10 mil of the hardener. And like all resin, stir it until you're bored and then stir it some more. And now comes the hard part. The hard part is actually putting the filler in. You can buy filler, but I've always made my own. And basically what it is, is something called micro balloons, which actually this isn't, this is Q-cells, but it's the same sort of thing. So it's little tiny little bubbles of nothing, which makes it sound like a chocolate bar. And this basically will bulk out this resin 
so that it doesn't weigh very much. Resin's quite heavy by itself. Um, so we'll put that in there. We probably should be wearing a mask. And if I was doing multiple batches of this, I'd go and get my dust mask on. Especially if it was breezy in here and the stuff was blowing around. It's awful stuff. But as you can see, you mix it in. And the thing about this is, this will make a fillery type thing. Mix it, giving it a whiz. In fact, ha, huh, that's the thick so. Which doesn't really matter because what I'm using it for is not, oh yeah, silly man. So, there's two things in this filler component. There's the micro balloons, which I held up to the camera, which weren't. And then there's something called Fixotrope, which is um, another product, which I suspect is like a little fiber, a little a flock type thing. Um, and that's really good for stopping your filler sagging. So if you just use resin and micro balloon and Q cells to um, make a filler, you end up with something that when you put it on, if it's on a vertical surface, it'll sag. And it's not very workable. If you put some Thixotrope in it, and, and I use one called Wacker HD, I'll make sure I put the lids on the right one, um, you end up with something that's like that, and that's not going to sag. And watch more, when you work it, like you could spread it like margarine. How nice is that? So basically, normally, I would use two-thirds Q-cell and one-third Thixo, which is probably a little bit much Thixo, really. Um, but it's not science. So this was 50 mil of resin um, and a little bit of micro balloons. And I've got something that's the consistency of cream. And like that's, like how nice is that to work with? Now the other thing is, because it's filler and you've just mixed it with resin, it makes the resin go off faster. So you only ever mix small amounts and you don't let it catch you out. Anyway, I better go and put this on the rudder. Here we are, back at the parking space rudder. And what I've done is I've started removing the anti valve because if I've got a glass along the bottom here, then it really needs to be sanded back to fresh fibre, you know, through the gel coat, through the anti valve, through the fibre, not the reverse order to that. Uh, and to do that, first of all, you have to um, remove the anti valve, which is soft. Antifoul is a soft paint, so it's really hard to um, sand. Well, you can't, all it does is clog the paper. So, you use one of these. It's slow work, but it's faster than using a sander and you can put the radio on. This is pretty much finished this side now. I'm going to sand it and we'll come back and see what it looks like then. So, I think this probably took about 10 minutes to sand. Um, and while I'm there, I'd like to introduce you to one of my favorite tools. This is my Festo uh, Random Orbit Sander. These are worth a lot of money but sanding is the shittiest job you'll ever do so buying a tool that makes it um, an easier task is well worth the money you could buy a random orbit um, 150 mil sander for I don't know probably a hundred bucks for one that's not just completely crap and this is closer to 600 um, and this is my second one I um, had one of these before and I used it so much I wore it out um, the switch in it died, I could have had it fixed and I was like, you know what, I love these things so much, I just want a new one. That process probably took 10 to 15 years, I guess. This one's um, still in its first 12 months, it's a baby. The five on the top is the actual orbit that it does in millimeters. So they, these come in a five and a three. The three, not so good for this sort of work where we have like a 40 mil, a 40 grit disc on here to like really rip into this. Threes are more like for like French polishing and that sort of thing. But what I wanted to show you is this. 
Obviously, back in the days when this boat was used for Colombian drug smuggling, they used to like put the drugs in here and then patch it over on their way to the US. And um, the buggers didn't do a very good job because you can see the antifoul. If you can hear it, there's like a... Can you hear that? The patch hasn't stuck because they've just patched over the old antifoul. So this black goes back under this white. So whenever you're doing some work, it's really, really important, excuse the car, it's really, really important to grind the whole job back so that your patch and your reinforcing and whatever it is you, you're doing in the repair sticks to like some virgin ground and not like paint or primer or, uh, or anything else. So I'm going to have to get the grinder out and grind this back and redo this patch here. I liked my Colombian drug story, but I've just thought of a better one. I reckon it got this damage ramming a submarine in the North Atlantic in the Second World War. Whatever it happened, whatever, however this happened, the front edge of the rudder is badly damaged and it was repaired really badly. Here we go, 24 grit disc, 125 mil angle grinder, my favourite brand of yellow. All done. Probably took about three minutes in all honesty. But there we go, you can actually see they've used polyester resin and chop strand mat to reinforce this damage here. There's a hollow through here now which I'm going to have to fill. But that's okay. All of this feels much more sound now. It's obviously been a few bunches of damage here because this is um, micro balloons which is sort of a brown pooey looking filler. Whereas this other stuff here I'm guessing is Q-cells which is what I use. Anyway, that used to look oh, that over you go. like that. So now I've got the other side to do. And I wonder if the repair on this side will be repeated over here. I guess we'll see. So it's uh, time for some resin and fiberglass. I meant to show you this, but I didn't. Excuse the car. Um, these two halves of the rudder were glued together down this seam here, and it looks to have split. So I'm putting some 200 gram, or six ounce per yard in the Yankee Torque, um, over this with, with uh, some West System epoxy. Um, I could fill the, the crack. But the crack is there because the rudder's moved somehow. It's a, it's basically flexed and popped. Um, so filling it probably just means that it'll pop again when it flexes. So basically what I'm doing here, first of all, I sanded this very smooth. Um, there's no uh, hollows in here now. It's, it's a nice even round curve. Um, and when I say smooth, I should say what I actually mean smooth, I don't mean fine. The sandpaper I used was quite coarse, but it means that the surface here is smooth. There's no nasty hollows in it. And the reason for that is fiberglass, sorry if my camera's pointing in the wrong way occasionally, fiberglass will just go over hollows and leave an air bubble. And you can say, oh, you know, like my girlfriend did, and, and quite rightly so, it makes sense. Why can't some resin just flow into the hollow and fix that up, fill that up. Oh, well, it may do, but you don't have any control over that. So it's best to like get a nice smooth surface and lay the glass over it. Anyway, this is one laminate. I'm going to do a second one and I'm tired of holding the camera. So as we talked about earlier on, the rudder was leaking through the bottom here somewhere. And now that I've sanded it back, I'm finding it really hard to see where the leak was. I can see like a small hole here and another holey type thing here. Maybe this, there's some dim lamination here that I'm, I'm like, I'm gonna have to deal with. Um, but anyway, what you can see is I've sanded this back to the, the fiberglass, polyester resin, chop strand mat, standard 
fiberglass, the way you build boats. Here's that other side of that um, repair we talked about earlier. So I've glassed this bit up. You don't fiddle with these furry bits off the end here because you'll just make a mess. So once that's gone off, I'll sand it and fair it and then sand it again. Um, so now the time has come to basically do what I've done here, down here. Troubling thing is I can't see where the leak is. I'm assuming the rudder's dry. I've left it long enough. Spent a lot of time in the sun um, and it had the holes in it like so that the inside could, the hollow bit inside could breathe has been good. So, you know, let's keep our fingers crossed. We sanded this back yesterday. Stuck some glass on it. Two layers of six ounce. Not a lot, but just want to like cover up the crack and add a little bit of structure. So now we're going to give it a sand back. Actually, I've already had a good crack at it with the Festo and um, put some filler over it. My neighbour saying goodbye. Always live in a friendly suburb. So before you put filler on something, you have to get the waxiness from the resin off. There's no wax in epoxy as far as I know, but there often is in polyester. And you just want to give that a rub with something quite coarse, just to smooth it over. Talked in a bit, bit earlier on about how important it is to um, not have hollows and lumps that are little pinholes and things like that because they'll end up being air bubbles because they just won't fill up with resin when you put when you do the glass layer. You can see I'm using a door prop to hold the rudder up for me. If you're ever hanging a door at home, you need a little bit of wood like this. Maybe you can't see it. Go like that. It allows you to put the door in when you put the hinges on, stuff like that. Facing the right way? Think so. So here we are back with the rudder. Just want to point these things out. I've sanded off the back edge, back to glass. We know this is two surfaces glued together when they made it, two halves. So, and we knew there was a crack on the front. So I'm interested if there was a crack on the back. I reckon we might have a couple of gluing faults. So we're going to fill those up. So here we are, we've run out of time. This needs to be on the boat tomorrow so we can get things sorted for this weekend's state heat. So, because there was some fairing compound on here, um, and uh, bogs and fairing compounds are actually a little bit porous, 
I've just brush coated some epoxy over this with some white pigment in it. Um, I forgot to sand this bit here before I did it. I was in such a hurry. I meant to be somewhere else. But um, it won't matter because uh, over winter, the boat's going to come out of the water and I'll give this a sand back and put a proper two-pack primer on it so that the anti-foul keys to this properly. This uh, very rough looking brush coat is simply just so that we can sail this weekend and it's the, the water's not going to get into the filler that I've put on there and, and sanded. Not the bit that I have sanded. Because obviously there's a few bits there that I've forgotten about in my rush. Because today's been a bit mad. I mean, if I don't do it now, I won't get a chance to do it tomorrow before we have to stick it on the boat. I hope you guys have found that interesting.